Okay, good evening. I'd like to go ahead and call to order the regular board of directors meeting from Ren Water on Tuesday, the 27th of February. Here, can I have a roll call, please? Yes, good evening. Director Larry Russell. Here. Director Jed Smith. Here. Uh, Vice President Matt Sampson. Here. And current, um, well, some, the director that won't be here today is uh, Director Monty Schmidt, and I believe that um, President Ranji Kush will be in later. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Can I have a motion to adopt the agenda, please? So moved. Second. Any public comment, Terry? There are none. Okay. Roll call vote. Yes. Director Russell. Aye. Director Smith. Aye. And Vice President Sampson. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, at this point, we'll be um, adjourning to a closed session. Um, and do we need to take public comment, Molly, for this? <clears throat> if there are comments on the closed session, yes. Great. Uh, any public comments on the closed session? There are none. Okay. We'll go ahead and convene to closed session. We'll reconvene once we're done. Thank, Thank you. you. Good evening, everyone. I'll call to order the Moran Water Board meeting of February 27, 2024. Terry, if we could have our roll call, please. Um, yes. We uh Director Larry Russell. Yes, but oh okay. I missed okay. I missed the first section. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. I'll get it right one time. Um we're on number four. Yeah, we're ready to go. Okay. We approved the agenda and everything's done. And we've had any, any public comments on the agenda. We, we've done that. All done. All done. We've already voted on the agenda. So I will then start with closed session. We are we uh, en ended closed session at about 620 with no reportable action items. Perfect. Moving on then to public comments on items that are not on the agenda. Yes, we have a couple. Uh, Larry Minikis and Ed Jamison. Go ahead, Mr. Uh, Minikis. Yes, good evening, folks. I just want to point out what's happening in the Midwest right now and in, in Texas, where in Texas, overnight, a fire quadrupled in size to 200,000 acres. And it just is a reminder that weather is unlike anything we've seen in the past. And fire is looks like it's a 12-month event. Um, just thought to point this out. Thank you and good evening. Good evening. Thank you. Mr. Ed Jamison, please. Yes, thanks. Uh, tomorrow morning, the district's water efficiency programs will be discussed. The board needs to be informed about East Bay Mud's discontinuing its AMI rollout last year, reflecting their determination that there would be virtually no return on the district's large required investment for AMI. All of MMWD's conservation programs need to be vetted with disciplined estimates of their expected cost per acre foot. Some of the district's water efficiency programs are indefensibly costly and need to be discontinued. As pointed out by conservation expert Madaus Consulting in November of 2022, the 2016 gray water ordinances, laundry to landscape and rain barrels programs provide absolutely trivial potential water savings. And that's at absurdly high costs. Madaus recommended that both programs be eliminated from the district's water conservation element plan. As for tomorrow's presentation, no consideration should be given to increasing rebates for the ineffective rain barrels program. Particularly with the large water rate increases the board has implemented, the board needs to show fiscal responsibility by rescinding the 2016 gray water ordinance. And the district's 2015 requirement that Marin's few new single family homes must have Las Vegas style landscaping is regulatory overreach and also needs to be rescinded. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jamison. And we also have a uh, Damien, please. Yes, sir. Thank you, uh, Damien here, born and raised in Wren City. Um, after years and years and decades of uh, ignoring Wren City, not just Wren Water, but the county as a whole, but ignoring us for decades as if we didn't exist. Um, 
what's going on now. Um, I, I'm a colleague of Terry Green. Many of you, I'm sure, know who Terry is. Colleague, close to colleague. Um, what's happening now is we're just getting started to do some some work in Marin City. Finally, just just getting started. But there's issues, and a couple of issues. One of the issues is uh, with the planning. Uh, you're still excluding us. You're, ex you're excluding Marin City residents and some of the planning. You know, some of the things that you're writing up moving forward, you're excluding us. It's still part of a history. Um, I don't want to say the R word racism, but everything and everybody is not racist. But when you exclude a community that's underserved, underserved for a reason, that's what do you say? What do you call it? Um, a big part of this is community outreach. And I am uh, of the know that you all Someone in here, I, I you know, I, the, who that person is, I'm not, I don't care at this moment, is reaching out to other communities to work on our behalf, outreach plans. And that's not, that's not right. We're not going to have that. We don't like it. We don't want it. And we're not going to stand for it. And we're not going to beg. We're going to say, do the right thing. Do not reach out to other communities to come in and tell us how we're going to engage in our community that we know better than you, community that we know better than the outside groups. So we're just getting started. Moving in the right direction, hopefully. Finally, we appreciate people being engaged and, and, and want to do better by the community, but we have a lot, a lot of work to do. And we're going to be engaged. There'll be more Damien's here soon. There'll be other Damien's and Roberts and Cedric's and Kwame's that'll be here with me to say you're not going to step on us in a way that's not correct. So we'll be back. We'll be here. And thank you. Thank you, Damien. And there are no further speakers. Thank you for coming. Okay, then uh, with that, we'll move to our directors and general managers announcements, comments. Uh, Larry, anything to start us off with? Uh, yeah, there was a, you wouldn't happen to have a copy of those notes, would you? I, no. I saw them and I blew right past them. I'll, I'll see if I can pull it together. There was a district operating committee last fr Friday. And um, now I'm spacing. <laughs> Yeah. We'll yeah. 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 Um, Matt. Sure. Um, Larry, I think uh, your your words rubbed off last time. The um, February seventeenth broom pull was canceled again because of the rains, and so um, it was a disappointment to not be out there that day. But I've registered for the March sixteenth one on Bald Hill, so third time hopefully is a charm on that, um, and would love to see some folks out with that. Um, I did want to um, acknowledge Paul Sellier um, and a big thank you for his presentation to the Tomales Bay Group on water quality and testing um, last Friday. It was very well received, very informative. I actually learned a lot from the presentation. And thanks for sending it, Paul. I really appreciate you doing that. So I know it took some extra time. So thank you for that. Um, a couple of things going on in Sacramento, legislation starting to get um, drafted up. <clears throat> Two things have come up so far that I think that we'd be interested in taking a look at. One, our current assembly member, Damon Connolly, is Assembly Bill 2196, and that's the one that's the reintroduction of beavers into the watershed areas. It'd be interesting to see if that would benefit us, if we'd like to support. And then Senator Dodd out of uh, North Bay has co-sponsored uh, Senate Bill 1159. That's roadside vegetation work and exemption from um, CEQA as we look to accelerate some of the, the mitigation efforts on the wildfire piece to see if we could have staff take a look at that as well to determine if that's something we'd like to support for those two pieces. Um, I did want to um, say a thank you and acknowledge um, for the general manager report one to put spill volumes in there over uh, our reservoir dams as we get into the rainy season. So thank you. That information is helpful. And also the irrigation control rebates um, as a line item for that piece. And surprisingly, they're taken off. It seemed like a really healthy start to that program. So nice work. I'm excited to see for that. And then lastly, just to acknowledge uh, watershed staff and a thank you to the rangers, especially for the call that occurred on the cataract trail where the triker fell and was unconscious into the creek. And um, excellent job by our staff as always to be able to render aid for that person. And then the report in your, in your um, report, um, 
Ben talked about a bystander providing some care. I don't know if it's customary that we acknowledge that bystander if we do have the information, but to be able to have, you know, bystanders helping bystanders on our watershed is always a good thing to highlight. So that's it. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Matt. Jed? Yeah, we had a finance uh, and administration committee meeting, special meeting of the board on Thursday, February 15th. Uh, staff provided the committee uh, with a review of the monthly financial and quarterly investment reports. Staff provided uh, the committee with a review of policy 33 and our investment policy uh, unchanged and uh, and uh, appropriately conservative. Uh, and then the public um, may access the, the recording of the uh, meeting and the documents on our website uh, uh, anytime. I, I do want to make a comment about Damien's presence here. Damien, that money is uh, to help community outreach will go through Marin City and not under my watch will it go elsewhere. And I believe we're on track. I'm not sure where that came from, but we're we're working closely with Terry and, and I fully expect us to be in line on this. Thanks, Jed. Larry? Yeah. Okay. Um, all set now. Brain refreshed. Um, there was a presentation on the wild land fire services contract. It's a three-year contract to provide uh, wildland fire contract crews to assist the district and to coordinate with us on what to do with vegetation piles. Um, there was a good solid discussion about the vegetation piles and uh, I asked the question, why don't they just chip them? And the answer, as I recall, was that it was too much material. The board referred this item to approve the contract to an upcoming board meeting. Staff provided information on construction contracts, solicitation for Marin City Phase 1 Pipeline Replacement Project, which is the one you were just talking about, um, and a proposed cooperative reimbursement agreement with the County Marin to contribute as part of the project in lieu of full repaving requirements. Um, that's obviously a, a major impact with uh, putting in new pipelines is the street. The project will install 9,200 feet of new pipe in Marin City, much of it funded through a grant from the Bay Area Integrated Regional Water Management Proposition 1. The committee referred this item to an upcoming meeting to be considered for board approval. Staff provided information on the planned spillway capacity and subsurface condition assessment, which included uh, dam safety analysis. A consultant will be selected through an RFP process to conduct the assessment. The committee referred this item to an upcoming board meeting as well. Uh, it's good to note that we will be using our ground penetrating radar in that assessment, which I'm pleased that that was a conclusion of a couple of years ago. Staff also provided an update on the EPA's uh, lead and copper rule revisions. Um, these revisions are not particularly appropriate or much of an issue with Marin because we don't have lead service lines. They are a major issue with agencies who have lead service lines because one of the requirements is a inventory of all your lead service line connections. Um, the public can access these reports and video recording of the February 16th meeting at their leisure. Okay. Thanks, Larry. Yes, yeah, nothing from me. So uh, move to Ben. If any general manager's announcements. Thank you. So um, our next item is our consent calendar and approval of that. And there's four items on the consent calendar: the minutes from our February 13th meeting, general manager's report for January of this year, approval of award for a contract for under the fire flow improvement program to replace the Redwood Drive pipeline. And then the last is approval of a land exchange agreement for the proposed Hind Tanks replacement project. Um, Terry, do we have any public comments on items on the consent calendar? There are none. Do we have a motion to approve our consent calendar? Yep, so move. A second. <clears throat> Great, thanks. Terry, could we have a roll call vote, please? Yes, Director Russell. Aye. Director Smith. Aye. Vice President Sampson. Yes. And President Cush. Aye. Okay, uh, then moving on to our regular agenda, item 8A is our water loss control program update. And Carrie, take it away. Thank you. 
Uh, good evening, Board. Carrie Pollard, Water Efficiency Manager. Um, so I'm joined this evening with Benjamin Bauer, our Superintendent of Operations. So this is a recent promotion, so congratulations, Benjamin. Um, but prior to that, he was supervising our leak detection team. So we came here with our technical experts to be able to kind of take a deeper dive into our water loss control program. We're going to start with an, our overview, of course. Um, we'll discuss our current practices. We'll go through some of our water loss reporting to the state, which is required. We'll talk about some performance indicators as a result of that state reporting, right? So we compare ourselves to the 500 other agencies that have, have completed that reporting. And then take a, a, a peek at some of the technologies we're evaluating to reduce our overall water loss. So with that, I'll turn it over to Benjamin. Thank you, uh, it's nice to be here. Um, I can review the current leak detection practices here at the district. Uh, the district owns 873 miles of potable water main and 24 miles of recycled water main. Uh, it's estimated that we survey uh, 200 miles uh, every year. Uh, the team utilizes a personal, uh, personal GIS database to plan and log those results. And the way we, uh, the way we find leaks is by listening for the lakes. And uh, whether it's by naked ear, as we think these, these guys are doing, uh, or more commonly a, uh, a, a leak noise amplifier or a correlator or logger that uh, senses the vibration of the pipe. Um, uh, it's the oldest and most reliable leak detection method. It's the team uh, walks a pre-planned route that's block by block. They listen to every meter, uh, every valve, every fire hydrant, and we feel like we do a, a very thorough search in that way. Uh, we're using uh, uh, the leak noise amplifier to do that search, and any noise that that uh, is heard uh, is followed up by work order, and that work order tracks the path of any necessary follow-up investigation. Uh, a, a, two staff complete these surveys, and the team goal is 200 miles of water main every year. Uh, this map represents the last three years. Um, it's color coded by year. Um, these are the miles of pipe uh, that were surveyed in those three years. Uh, it kind of looks like we're we're every there, everywhere. Um, we are. We do prioritize uh, the area that is searched by uh, least recent areas or prioritized for the next year. Uh, we also prioritize, prioritize uh, leak prone areas and areas that are uh, slated to be overlaid by uh, agencies. Uh, a, a paving project that goes in, we wanna make sure that if there's any discoverable leaks, we find those before we need to cut new paving to, uh, to, to make that repair. Between 2021 and 2023, uh, the leak detection team surveyed 619 miles of pipe. Uh, that team discovered 122 district-owned leaks. Uh, those leaks are represented and they're plotted on this map. It's also color-coded by year. Uh, you can see that there is a number of different kinds of leaks that were, uh, were found and repaired. Uh, by far, uh, we found uh, the most common was a district service leak. A district service leak is the, the, the lateral from the, the main to the, to the meter. Um, that leak is excavated. Uh, the, the water loss is observed by the crew leader and it is recorded in a, uh, a leak report with, which is uh, collected in the work order. Um, by repairing those 122 leaks, uh, there's an estimated savings of uh, 38 acre feet annually. Uh, it's important to note that the, the leak detection team is uh, finding leaks that are not observable and they would not have been called in if it wasn't for this team. Uh, this team uh, found about 10% of the overall leaks that were repaired by the, by the department, uh, about 1,195 leaks that uh, were repaired by the department. Um, those leaks primarily are observable. Uh, uh, typically a resident will notice water uh, they'll call the district. The dist district will dispatch a tech. Uh, that tech will classify the leak in one of three ways. Uh, class one is the highest priority. 
It's an emergency. It's typically defined by the need to turn off the water. Uh, it's an, it's, it requires an immediate uh, response. A class two leak is also an emergency that water loss is typically manageable. Uh, we're trying to keep that water on for as long a period of time as possible. Uh, the, uh, the repair is done by the next shift, uh, typically the best next business day. Uh, a class three leak uh, is minor in nature. Uh, we try to repair that leak in two or three weeks, uh, but it allows time to plan, post, and notify residents. Thanks, Ben. Mm -hmm. All right, so now we're going to- Can um, we ask some questions before we leave that? Sure. Um, are you familiar with Camstrup? I am uh, not. AMIs. I, I think it's something we should look at. They're Danish, and um, they were the subject of a presentation at Sonoma Water. Um, they have acoustic listening devices on each meter. So they kind of speed up this process and give you, you know, 60,000 potentially connections to listen. Mm -hmm. And it, it's something very, it caught my attention in their presentation. Um, they're also a, uh, a non-moving part uh, meter. So it's electronic, not um, mechanical. Um, I think you guys are doing a great job. And um, are you still troubled by the background noise? Uh, yeah, uh, obviously in certain areas, uh, areas that are uh, densely populated or particularly freeways, uh, sometimes we get a, a hum from a, a trans transformer. Um, there's ways around that. We, we have loggers that uh, we can deploy uh, for surveying uh, during times that are more quiet. Um, but yeah, sure. Yeah, I, it was really a question more for the board than it was oh, yeah, for you. Of course. I just wanted them to know that yeah. one of the problems, because it sounds great. It's just the realities of implementing it are a little tricky because there's so much background noise that it these are pretty subtle things. And if you've ever seen the phone company, they actually shove nitrogen into their lines and then they have an acoustic device similar. The difference, of course, is the whistle is pretty sharp from theirs because it's a basically a small pinhole that's out in the atmosphere, but idea is similar. Um, the materials that leaked were copper? Uh, variety of uh, pretty much everything we own leaks. Well, I'm um, thinking of the, the ones that are the lateral connection. The lateral connection we found, uh, you know, the in the copper, it's pinholes um, based on the, the soil type. Uh, and the plast in the uh, polybutylene, the, uh, it's a little, it forms uh, lateral fissures and how cracks. Many, how many butylenes do we still have? Oh, uh, I don't have that number. Uh, it's quite a few. Is it, I mean, there was a settlement with Shell on that. We yes. didn't We didn't do that? We didn't replace them? We did them? do that. We did not replace them all. I see. Well, that might be a priority we want to think about because that product is a, is a faulty product. We are, uh, every time we see it, we remove it. Okay, good. Um, what do we do about the replacement laterals if we replace in copper? Do we do anything to make them more compatible with the soil? Uh, we uh, So we're currently um, buying pre-wrapped uh, copper. Um, so it's a, it's a manufactured... Uh, we used to roll it with yeah, 10 yeah. mil tape, tape yeah. and now it's and now it's a a, a seamless uh, uh, coating. Uh, that seems to help a lot. Normally, you don't use coatings without cathodic protection. Uh, so it's yeah. So uh, the cathodic uh, protection group is uh, is uh, monitors every. Uh, they 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 monitor the systems. Uh, we do add uh, anodes to to areas that are. Are suffering and just roughly what's the cost of repairing a typical lateral like that uh roughly uh to uh, renew it um it's leaking and needs to be replaced yeah yeah so uh, the renew is the preferred method uh i i would say with the paving costs uh in some probably um 10 grand okay i just want to again for them to understand the magnitude of what it costs to yeah. do the work. That's perfect. Thank you. 
Jordan. Thank you. Matt. All right. Thanks, Benjamin, and congratulations on the on the promotion. I just do you have a sense of what proportion of leaks are within the system and what proportion are within the customer uh, jur uh, jurisdiction? I don't have numbers for you, uh, but by far uh, the 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 customer is the source of water that is investigated. Uh, I think uh, I I don't I, I wish I could back that up with some numbers for you. Uh, I but much of the time or most of the time it's a customer related issue and not always a leak uh over irrigation right sewage yeah yeah yep. great thank you all right <clears throat> moving on so um a brief chat on our water loss reporting so we've been completing um an annual water loss um, and submitting that to the state since 2016. But just recently, within the last few years, the state has established regulations around water loss. And, and these state water use objectives are often also referred to as making conservation a California way of life legislation. And so these different ways to say, refer to the same thing. So the state has established a water loss standard for the district, and as they have for every water utility in the state. And it's unique for every organization. So for us, our real losses is 28.5 gallons per connection per day. And so this is the amount that the state has deemed is an allowable amount of loss to be compliant with this regulation. And so <clears throat> before we took, take a look at how we're doing, I thought it might be useful to talk, take a look at how we calculate our losses. So we start with our total water supplied into the system, right? Whether it's imported or from our own sources. And then that's split out into our authorized consumption. And within authorized consumption, there's different, different types. We have our build metered. So this is right water that goes through a customer's meter and then is billed for, to them. We have unbilled meters. So for example, our facility here, we don't send ourselves a bill, but we know where the water went and we know how much it was utilized. And then unbilled, unmetered. So this would be things like system flushing. So just like our leak detection crew estimate leak repairs, they also estimate the amount of flushing that's being utilized, water that's being utilized for flushing. And so it's not considered loss, but we, we don't have an exact number, but right, it's authorized use. We take that authorized use out and then we're, what's remaining is the water losses. Water losses are then broken into, further broken into other categories, right? So we have our apparent losses. This is often referred to as paper water. So these would be things like our meter inaccuracies or data errors. We know that they're occurring and we know that there's some water loss to those. And there's an estimate that's that's um, produced through this model. What she's saying is that large meters have errors. So what we do is monitor the water coming in versus the water we sell. So it's it not, it it probably isn't real. It's just a number. Um, right, it's not water within, our, not real losses we should be searching for within our system, but the total between the two is, is water losses, right, within the system. So it's in one category or the other, right? And so, and then ultimately we're left with, we're left with real losses, which is what um, Benjamin told us about. So how have we been doing? So when we look from 2016 through 2022, it's been fairly consistent. We're at about 2,000 gallon, or excuse me, 2,000 acre feet per year. Um, I will note, you may think, well, why are we looking at 2022? And here we are in 2024. We report to the state January 1st of each year. So we just submitted our 2022 reporting requirement. So we're always, you know, a year plus lag behind. Um, it is fairly consistent. You know, 21, 22 is a little bit of a drop. You know, we had lower water into the system, that may be part of it. The other piece, which I'll touch on when I talk about the performance indicators, is we're changing how we're collecting some of our data, right? And so we're kind of refining our, our metrics in that way, which may also impact overall um, totals. Just a reference, that 28.5 uh, gallons per connection per day is mm -hmm. 2,500 acre feet. So we're doing better than that, but it's, it's a still fairly significant number to allow that much water to, if it were actually being lost. It is absolutely right. And so we're, that's why, right? That's why we want to take action and, and recognize, even though we may be compliant, which we'll touch on in a moment, um, right? What else can we be doing to reduce the overall losses? So as I mentioned, we have about 500 water utilities within the state that submit these water loss reports, and they use the same methodology, the same reporting tool. So we should be able to do some comparisons between us and others. 
we're going to start with our data validity score. So this is what I was referring to as, you know, it, it really is telling us what's the level of confidence that we have as staff with the inputs that we're putting into this model. Um, using the state specific standards. So things like meter inaccuracies, right? So what are our meeting, meter testing and calibration policies? Do we have a policy? Is it being followed? Is it being documented? And so that would be the one validity score that is associated with the meter accuracies line item, right? And so we do this for each one of those entry points to come up with um, where we land. Um, and where we landed in 2022, we were at 63. So kind of some um, yeah, great, great question. So that's just the range of validity scores. And then the Y axis is the number of suppliers within that, um, within that range. So there's a handful of folks that have a validity score between 30 and 34, a very low number, right? Most, most are kind of on the, on the other end where higher level of con confidence of their, their data. Each of these next slides, thank you for that reminder, is a number of suppliers and then a different metric on the bottom. So, so Carrie, just in this slide, you're you're telling us the confidence level to in some way of the data. Exactly. So, as our confidence increases, our validity score will increase, and we should feel more confident about how we're breaking out those water loss into those two buckets of apparent versus real. So, we want the validity score to go up, and there's opportunity for improvement, and we're starting to implement some of those, which is why we're we feel like we're further refining. Um, overall losses. It takes years, right? It's going to take us some time to establish what the baseline is under these new parameters. Do you think we should be doing more than 200 miles a year? I mean, that's like five years to do the system. I, I, I don't have it. It's an interesting question. I think we're we don't have the data, but I think we're probably closer beating kind of an industry standard recommendation. I don't know if you've ever seen anything, Ben, that suggests what it is, but it'd be interesting. AWWA probably does have some industry standards as part of its effort for us to take a look at. That's great. I, uh, believe it. I think so. Right. We hit every spot once every five years, maybe the more priority spots a little more frequent. Yeah, it's it's. um it's something to think about yeah. because uh, you know industry standards are whatever you know it's it's there's a variety of reasons they have the numbers they have right and i think what you'll see here a question is is that the answer and or some of this new cutting edge or emerging technologies yes. or combinations yes. so i i think it'll evolve but it, it's a good question of what is the industry standard what's the recommendation um well, and more importantly, though, I think, what do we need? You know, the industry standard is one thing, but what is the real issue is what do we need to do here? And would it make sense to invest more money and speed up the process? So let's say we, let's say we doubled that to get to, to two and a half years. You know, I, I don't have an opinion one way or the other. Right. Moment. And then. You know, would we assume a linear, that's the kind of work we, and then yeah. what's the cost for the additional 38 or whatever it was, acre feet a year? Does that make sense? Yeah, which, you know, obviously isn't very much. Um, well, I did want to say that it's not just about the water savings, you know, even though there weren't a huge amount of main leaks um, found, or 20 or something, and you know, potentially some of those would have been catastrophic, right? And you think about sure. the savings in cost of a planned job and getting there and doing it versus middle of the night calling folks in, potential property damage, potential exposure to chlorinated water and creeks. I mean, this really is an important program and it's, in my view, far more um, than the water itself. Well, and then the, just for putting everybody on the same page, there's a event that happened in Belvedere on the island, and the um, two BMWs were destroyed by rocks being thrown out of our uh, trench by the water from the cast iron main that nuked them for like six hours or something like that, and they were toast. So, you know, there's consequential damages too from leaks besides people being upset and, 
And, you know, oh, there's real claims. It's a constant real claims. Yes. Uh, not every break, but it's oh, even not... landslides can occur. Because well, for of sure. Our problems. That's far less frequent than yes, of course. the claims coming in day to day on. Sure. Yeah, I, think, I think we should get yeah. let Barry yeah. yes, get through please. this. Okay. Um, the next um, performance indicator I included here is our apparent losses. So in 2022, we were at 10. You know, there might be some opportunity for us there. Um, but the state, the state has not established a standard for apparent loss. It's it's more of a, a data point that we have to report out on, and so we've we've included it. What does that mean, apparent? That that would be the the paper water that I had mentioned, right? So meter inaccuracies, data errors. The real loss, gallons per connection per day, is where the state has established a standard for us. Again, that was 28.5 gallons per connection. We're currently at 14.6. So, you know, when we look at the range of others, you know, water suppliers, we're, we're, we're looking really good. But that doesn't mean that there's not an opportunity to continue to reduce. And finally, the total between the two, right? Recognizing if it's not in one bucket, it's in the other. And so we want to kind of look at it as a whole to see, make sure we're looking for any opportunity as we as we move forward. I don't understand because that number would be like 1,200 acre feet per year. And we're at 38. So it, it's a little surprising to me. Or number of connections. We, I mean, it will depend on the multiplier. I'd be happy to send you the, the details on yeah, that. If you would, I'd appreciate that. Sure thing. Yeah. Okay. Um, and finally, wrapping up with evaluating um, technologies to reduce our, our real losses. So, so what are we doing here? So we've hired eSource, which is a water loss consulting firm, to do two, two main tasks. One was to look at our reporting and our data collection processes and make sure, you know, is there something that we should be doing that we're not? Is there an opportunity that we're missing or a data collection point that we should be focusing in on to um, increase that data validity score and increase our confidence? The other piece was let us know if there's technologies that we should be evaluating, and the one you mentioned is on their list. So, so we we haven't gotten to it yet, but we will um, to see you know where we should be focusing. So, there's these are kind of four strategies that we're really focusing in on. First, it's increasing staff awareness, right? So. Benjamin, very knowledgeable. This is kind of his expertise, but there's a whole water loss team. It's finance, it's water efficiency, it's planning. And so making sure we're all up to speed on where 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 there are maybe opportunities in that and how we evaluate those. So looking at um, any benefits that could be you know possible, really to supplement our current efforts, right? We know that the acoustic survey work will have to continue, right? But what is there other is there other things that we can be implementing that get us there a little faster? Um, are there pilots that we could be implementing or that others have already done that we can learn from as we go through this evaluation and, and realize that it's likely not going to be one silver bullet? It's not going to be one answer. It's going to be, you know, different situations require different technologies and what makes the most sense for us. So that's kind of what we're looking at. So eSource has provided us a list of vendors. And of course, we call those vendors and they're coming in and they're telling us about how wonderful their technology is. Um, and we appreciate that and we're learning a lot. So I have two examples. One is Astera, um, is a satellite-based leak detection. Um, they have satellite imagery that can penetrate 10 feet below the surface, allowing for dielectric analysis to determine if there's soil moisture, right? So they can not only tell us if there's soil moisture, they can tell us if it's freshwater, seawater, sewage water. This is what they're telling, right? We, 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 we're, we're taking a deeper dive, but this is what they said. So, Gary, just to, yep. they, they can distinguish between those different water sources using yep. some kind of conductivity yep, exactly. differential. Yep. And so it's satellite imagery, so they can't pinpoint. They can't say it's out in front of our building, but they can give us a 300-foot radius, and then our crews would then go out and need to survey that area and determine if, in fact, there is a leak there. So very interesting. Um, we're reaching out to a, different folk, a group of different folks who have utilized it. Some love it. Some are still questionable and looking for the, but oh, right? How do we compare to those types of system? Doesn't make sense for us. So that's one. Does, it, does it work better or worse in coastal areas? So we haven't, well, I think that'll be part of our evaluation. So I don't know. How much? Roughly. Uh, one time, one pass over a year is about 80,000. Most do it multiple times a year to um, have a better understanding of any new leaks that may be occurring. 
The other example um, that we've had come and speak to us is a molar is Mueller with a, the, one of their products, which is a, a acoustic logger attached to hydrants. So these are permanent installations. They use cell service, kind of like our AMI technology. It's machine learning. They look late, you know, when there's very very little background noise, and then would notify us if they feel that there's a leak. And it's it ha has to happen a number of times before they would send us a notification. Some of the challenges is that the minimum is five gallons per minute, right? And so a lot of those leaks would already be surfacing. And so is that does that make sense? And also the distance from hydrant to hydrant, you still have to go out and again, pinpoint exactly where we're looking. So, you know, all of these are kind of things that are examples of, of technology that we're looking at and just trying to figure out what might make the most sense. All the hydrants? Some utilities do do all the hydrants. Yeah. So it might be- Th These are also movable. Yeah, right? of course, do these of course. And yeah. probably stealable. Yeah. yeah. Also. Probably. Okay, and wrapping up. So we'll complete to do complete our, our state requirements, of course, right, to track our performance, uh, those performance indicators, make sure that we're continuing to progress. We'll continue to evaluate these new technologies, appreciate the, the insight and suggestions. Of course, the goal is then to build upon what we're currently doing, but yet make it informed based on what other technologies are out there, right? We want to you know, not set aside the good work that's already happening. Determine if there's any pilots either that we can leverage or we can implement to provide, be more informed and come back to the board to give updates on all of this as it as it moves forward. Um, A quick question line. about the hydrant ones. That means the hydrant has to be left on. No. No? How can it listen without being on? It's... Uh... Similar to a, a like any other logger that would just drop directly onto the a, a metal surface, it's tied to the the system, and so it's listening to the vibration of the pipe. Similar okay. to you all out there listening, yes, it's, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. But it's on the head, right? Yeah. So the fire department, that's where I'm headed, is the fire department has to take it off yes. in order to use the hydrant, and that just it just spins off basically. Any other board comments, questions? Can I just one one thing? Um, you know, we're well below the regulatory standards currently for real water losses. That's that's good to hear. You're trying to improve on that. Would would it be reasonable to set a goal or a target for the amount of reduction we might try to achieve? Something to shoot for? Maybe something. Yeah, I mean something we can. Yeah, I, Something to consider. So, yeah. Let, let us consider that. It, it's a good question. Um, let us give it some thought. See and, what comes out of this study and do we see opportunities ahead? Can we set a date for you guys to come back? Like three months or six months well, or something? So this is really an update to the ongoing study. So the next step would be completion and maybe the next couple of months, and then we'll bring it back to the board with the recommendations and what staff's recommending in terms of building the program. That works, but I, I'd still like to push for a date, um, say by July 1st, you know, so it doesn't just keep slipping and slipping. Or do you have a plan? When When's the report supposed to be done? I, I'm not pushing. I'm just asking the question. I think we should probably circle back. So we have a draft okay. um, and and we'd like to continue at least to do our initial evaluation before we, we know, before we know exactly where we think we may need to go and the timing on that. How many of these vendors did the e-source folks? There were, there were about 10 different technologies, oh, that's not so bad. which are, you know, each has you know, at yeah, least vendors, five vendors, yeah. you know, so, you know, how many times do we need to hear them? So, you know, Great. We'll go uh, are there any public comments on this item? There are none. Okay. Thank uh, you. Thanks a lot, Terry, Benjamin. We can move on then to item 8B, which is our update on water supply roadmap long-term projects. Good evening, uh, Paul Sellier, Water Resources Director. Um, I am. Good evening, Paul Sellier, Water Resources Director. That sounds so much better. Um, 
I'm joined uh, by Xavier Arias with Woodard and Curran and uh, Tim Taylor from Corolo. And as youthful as they appear tonight, I can assure you these guys have a, a serious amount of experience between them. And we are very fortunate indeed to have them with us. They're both technical practice leaders within their respective firms and um, a few years of experience, as I say. Um, tonight, we're here to give you a presentation on some of the, the longer term projects that we're working on in, in water supply. Um, our sort of menu for the evening is just a quick background is sort of how did we get here? Um, you know, hearkening back to, to the drought in 2021 and then taking a look at some in-system improvements, which are part of the roadmap, but we haven't really spent much time talking about them, but just to highlight that we are working on those and then get into some detail on the regional conveyance alternatives that the team's been working on since September. And then we'll conclude with a, a brief look at sort of a teaser on local storage and, and then get into our, our next steps. So without further ado, um, and I'll go quickly because I know you guys want to hear the real experts tonight. So our, our background, if you remember in April of 2021, uh, casting our mind back, the board declared a water shortage emergency. And by October of 2021, October 1, as you can see in the chart here, our storage levels were at 27,000 acre feet. Nicasio was just about empty. Um, it was pretty, pretty serious conditions facing the district. And you can see the water um, storage projections in those colored dashed lines out to the future showing potential for actually running out of water uh, in one scenario. Our really, our only supply option the only project, and, and we looked at as many as we could, but within the time we had, the only option we had was really putting that pipe across the Richmond San Rafael Bridge. And that's what we started work on. Of course, uh, three weeks later than that last chart that I showed you, um, it started raining in October, sort of significant amounts of rain that we hadn't seen, maybe 100 year type rainfall. And within three or four months later, we'd received 41 inches of rain and our reservoirs were almost spilling. And so in, in February of 2022, we embarked on, uh, sort of pivoted away from the emergency nature of the project work that we were engaged in, pivoting away now, having some time with water and storage to consider what really our best supply options would be. Um, and, and with that, sort of over that course of time, that 2022, February 22 to February 23, um, was the strategic water supply assessment that was performed by Jacobs Engineering resulting in the roadmap that the board uh, selected in February of 2023. And so while we're looking at those charts, it, it's just it reminds us that really the project driver for us is about drought risk. Um, this chart, uh, it shows in the blue line, this is runoff into our reservoirs. And um, it's a bit vague, but you can see that the, the highest ones there, those peaks are near 250,000 acre feet of runoff. And just as a reminder, we have about 80,000 feet of capacity. The little brown line down towards the bottom there, that's 40,000 acre feet. And that's about our total system demand, potable, evaporation, stream releases. Um, so you can see that most years we've got ample water supply. And again, just focusing us in on this nature of a problem that we're looking to solve, which is this vulnerability to drought conditions. One of the things that hit me about this, can you back this curve, is that those could also be visioned as atmospheric river events, the especially yeah. the high ones. You know, so it's kind of the frequency of those major atmospheric rivers. Yeah, it's it's a lot of water. Um, so tonight, so this is the, the roadmap uh, sort of graphic that we're all familiar with. And, and tonight we're going to focus in on those three boxes that, that are circled in red in, in district improvements, our Sonoma Marin partnership alternatives and the local storage enlargement. We're just going to kind of give you a little teaser on that. We're coming back to the board in March with more details on that one. But while we are only talking about those tonight, it's not to suggest that we aren't actually doing things. Um, Sorry, did I get something wrong here? So there is work. Sorry, quickly back to that, Paul. I, I, I um, 
<laughs> One anecdotal set of feedback that I've had from multiple folks about our strategic plan was that we're a little slow in getting a significant enhancement to our water supply. And I, I know this is what we've approved and, and I'm supportive of this, uh, but 3,500 acre feet in, in a few years and then another six in six years, I'm hearing is a little tight and I'm hearing folks saying, hey, listen, you raised rates, guys, let's make it happen. Let's not wait for another drought. A drought could happen next year. It could happen the year after. I would love to see us blow away these goals and come to some solutions as quickly as we can, as thoughtfully as we can, as inexpensively as we can, and and using the right you know procedures and processes, et cetera. But let, let, let's treat this as a crisis like it was two years ago. We don't have a big supply and let's, let's sprint as thoughtfully and fast as we can. We are paddling as fast as we can under the surface. Um, I know sometimes it's hard to understand the nature of these projects. There is a process and just things that we need to, as you say, move quickly, but cautiously. Um, so we're trying to be prudent in that respect and balancing those two kind of characteristics of the work that we're doing. Um, so, and and with respect to the work that we are doing, um, it's not like it's all planning. There are elements of the roadmap that are already in progress. The Sulahuli electrification that the board's heard updates on, um, the stream release automation, the Phoenix to Bon Tempe uh, connection, um, and of course the water efficiency a master plan, and, and we heard tonight an update on on water loss. Um, so there are things that we're looking at. Um, and I, I believe when we were looking at water loss originally, we were targeting somewhere around a ten percent number. But as as Ben was suggesting, you know, with more information, we can sharpen that focus on what that number should be. Um, so there are things we're doing, and 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 even these, while they're considered short-term actions, they're not trivial. They're significant engineering projects and together they're going to add about a thousand acre feet to our water supply. Um, and we know we've got a lot more work to do. Uh, we've got the right team to do it and, and we are moving quickly as we can. So to date, those teams that I talked about, they're starting, they've started work on the in district improvements. We just talked about Sulahuli electrification in Phoenix and so on. And those teams are, are kind of refining and really getting in pretty deep at this level to some of these alternatives to the extent, and you'll see tonight, where we're developing some new versions of those alternatives. Um, and that work is going to be feeding into CEQA as we move forward. So all of it is sort of connected, and we're trying to, to take steps today so that we don't have to repeat them tomorrow. And that, I think, will help us with our overall timeline. We're working with Sonoma Water to refine the estimates for winter water availability, which will, of course, be a key aspect of any conveyance project. And as well, we're working on our system model to make sure that once we settle on projects, we can identify exactly how they work for us. So the process then um, for the teams is, as I say, this further define and developing the projects and this is leading to a, a couple additional alternatives that you'll see here tonight. Um, and we're going to be developing and have developed criteria, and we're going to introduce those criteria tonight and talk more to you about those at a subsequent board meeting. And those criteria will help us screen the alternatives down to the short list. And then that short list is where we're going to take a deep dive on the engineering side uh, to allow us to get to a preferred project selection. And none of this is happening in a vacuum. We'll be bringing the board along on each of those critical steps. So the criteria, which, you know, this is some of this may seem feel sort of familiar, familiar, excuse me, from the strategic water supply assessment. They're generally similar. Um, and, and these criteria are what the sort of overall categories are. And there's more descriptions that we can bring to help understand what we mean by some of these terms. Um, and, and you can see the categories up there. Oh, sorry. Just on, on the previous slide where you show the the the, the steps, um, it'd be great if we had a timeline, you know, underneath. We we those. Oh, it's coming up. The well, we could add it certainly to embellish this slide. It's a good idea. Um, but we do have a a, a 
timeline coming up as we kind of conclude with the schedule for the for the conveyance work. Great, thanks. Yeah. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it off to Xavier Arias with Woodard and Kern to talk us through the um, in-district improvements. Good evening, President Kush, members of the board. I, I wanted to talk about some improvements that um, that were first surfaced in late 2021, as, as Paul talked about during the drought emergency. And a, a lot of good ideas were considered then. So um, wanted to update you on on how they fit into this the the current strategic plan. So th th those improvements, these are in system improvements. So in contrast to some of the the projects that you've got an update on about, say, electrifying Sulahuli, these are within the district's distribution system. So a lot of small diameter treated water pipes, and th there were bottlenecks that right now. Um, prevent use of more winter water. So the idea is, well, we wanted to identify improvements within the district's distribution system that could allow us to take more supplemental Sonoma water in the winter. And, uh, the, and the, the reasoning there is that water is available generally only in the winter. And that's at a time when district demand is limited. And I'm gonna show you this in a little more detail in the next few slides, but um, district demand, if, if it were higher in the winter, we wouldn't need this, this work, but unfortunately um, the supply and the demand are not matched up. So here's an example of when the water is available. And we have a lot of scenarios and we're, we're going through all that. This is just to give you a sense of the shape of the curve, which it's winter water is available in the winter. It seems maybe obvious, but there's a lot of nuance here about how much and when and under what conditions. But this is what we're fundamentally up against, um, that we, we have water um, availability, no matter what scenarios you overlay, will be more in the winter months, December, January, February in particular. And then we, we look at what system demands are historically. So this is a, just taking a 10 year slice, but we could have taken a, a larger slice. It looks about the same. And what you see is um, demand in the winter goes down to about 15 or even less, uh, that's million gallons a day. And we're trying to match that up with that, that winter water. I'm gonna overlay it in the next one, but you can see you know, the reason it goes down, of course, outdoor usage goes down. So when we, when we try to overlay those two slides, what we're trying to do here, we take, take the supply, that's this winter water available in light blue. Match it up with the graph I showed you, and you can see they're almost exactly a, not fitting. So, so our, our challenge is to figure out ways to move more water through the system in the winter. And you know, in, in the best case, you would try to meet virtually all of your demand with this imported water when it's available, at least if, you're, if you need it. Um, one of the, the most obvious challenges is, if, I think for, for the purpose of reliability, Right now, San Geronimo treatment plant needs to at least run at an idle. Uh, so we want to keep that running, but possibly improving its turndown capability so that it could run at a very, very low rate if you could move all this water through the system. So like I mentioned, in late 2021, we were, we were looking in great haste at some of these ideas and how many of them could we implement and how quickly. And we did get a, a respite from all that, that rain in late 2021. But these ideas are fundamentally good. And as we are taking a closer look at them, they have benefits that go beyond just taking winter water in a drought. So I think that's that's the really good news. These are the concepts uh, that they, they were identified back then. And so the, the earlier work was focused on really solving that immediate problem. Um, how do we use winter water? Um, but we are realizing that many of these projects turn out to overlay with, with um, things that you need to do anyway, whether it's a corroded pipe, or whether there's a way to improve system flexibility. So whether you have a drought or not, whether it's winter or summer, some of these projects turn out to provide great value. So I, w, just, just one clarification on this. So what you're suggesting is that the goal would be to bring in more water in the winter than we're currently bringing in from Sonoma, say during the regular import period. So we're, we're trying to increase our capacity because we see the potential to bring in more. Yes, it, it it wouldn't be that you would bring it in all the time, but if you're if you're down in storage, say as you if we had another replay of 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 the fall of 2021, yeah, we would be trying to bring in as much as we possibly could, and the reason is then you, you're saving every drop in storage that you can. 
And we're con- currently our infrastructure limits our ability to achieve that higher capacity. Exactly. Generally, you're trying to move the water from north to south. And that just wasn't how the system was designed. Right. The system sort of grew organically, as you know, over a hundred year period, but it certainly wasn't optimized to move water from the north to the south. Great. Quick question. Do you anticipate um, a potential winter demand that exceeds the amount of water that we can currently take from Sonoma now? Um, winter demand? Is it, no, I mean, I, th- I think winter demand right, right now, I, I showed you 15, uh, uh, roughly. Right. And that's... That's in the ballpark of what we could take now. Remember, there's other other limitations on how much we can actually right. take. Okay, thank you. Well, remember, there's also limitations on distribution. Yes. So that's the, what, the problem is we can bring the water in, but we can't do anything with it. So it it services that side, Tiburon and those guys, the 25% we get. But if you made it 50%, we don't have a p- ability to push it up the hill. So we can solve some of that with with these these projects. I think I, I didn't get into all the details, but the other thing is during the night demands go even lower. So if if I tell you, well, the winter demand, you know, let's say at a given scenario, it's twelve million gallons a day, that means maybe it's fifteen during the day or sixteen during the day, and it really drops off at two or three in the morning. So one of the problems when we we try to develop these alternatives and make sure they work, they need to work through that 24 hour cycle, even if you have a few days of very low demand. But they are fundamentally um, good ideas that provide lots of value beyond beyond the winter water taken in a drought. So that's why I think they they really are worth further developing. So that's what we're working on doing. And generally we see these projects as having such such high utility there's something you'd want to do pretty much no matter what regardless of what we do with conveyance or storage on the larger scale so this is kind of a summary of what i just said benefits in all years is what we're seeing and that independent utility regardless of of which pipe or which storage improvement we choose for the larger scale strategic water supply um, augmentation these projects, some combination of the projects I just showed you on the previous slide would make sense. So we are working on further refining them, make sure that they're the right size and being done in the right order and integrated with other things you need to do in the system. Uh, but the highest priority ones, our, our intent is develop those for, for consideration along with your other CIP projects. And I think uh, in the discussion we had the other day about this, um, which of these, if any, can be applied to Fireflow? That would be among those those many benefits, yes. Well, more than the benefits of, it's the price. The, the, the money right. is different. Yeah, the funding. Yeah. Yeah, maybe on that one point, Zevi, I'd be good at some, you know, uh, it, so these in-system improvements sort of, they address capital maintenance needs in, a, as, in addition to improving the uh, resilience of the water supply. But it'll be good to hear your thoughts on whether investments in these improvements compromise in any way our ability to do much larger scale conveyance or storage is there you know is there do we have to decide where to put the money versus being able to do a bit of everything that's it's a good question and we'll be this is kind of introducing this concept so as it gets more developed we'll be bringing it back and talking about the cost and ways different ways we can approach it what we're hearing is we may just look at it as potentially like another criteria in our cip process and slowly bring these projects in to our just natural cip and continue with the larger projects but that's in context we'll also bring how much water are we talking about and the answer is this is not going to solve our issue, but it it's a nice piece of the puzzle and we get all these other benefits. It's sort of kind of a no-brainer. The question is over what time will we do this as we tackle the larger ones? And I think you should think of this as not as capital maintenance. I don't know what that term means exactly, but capital improvement. These are actually changes. The way I, I would look at that map that was up there is think of these as pinch points or something like that simple-minded so that there's a restriction there that's unnecessary or unsystem desirable. Yeah. We called it the bottleneck study. 
yeah. bottlenecks. Yes. Yes. <laughs> But Ranjeev, I think your point is spot on. So, you know, we need to be thoughtful about our capacity to fund these projects, our debt capacity, the impact on rates in the future. You know, what's the best bang for our buck in order to provide the best supply at the lowest cost that we possibly can for our customers and and be thoughtful about the state and federal regulation. So it, it all has, it all fits together. And I've, I've asked Ben at in probably the June July time frame as these these scenarios start to come to fruition to have a really thoughtful financial review of of the impact of of these decisions and and how much we can how much really we can take on and that's Thank the you. desirability of using the fireflow money because it's separate money but we have to coordinate with the fire chiefs because the the money is already allocated going forward so these are new ideas which may or may not have been, I don't know, some of them may actually be fire flow changes, or are these all new? No, I, I think we need to look and see which, th there could be some that are already identified in fire, fire flow. We don't know that for sure at this point. Um, but then, you know, the ones that aren't, that f we think may fit a fire flow, we'd have that conversation. I'd be surprised if there aren't an overlap. Um my recollection is that the decisions on fire flow were made in issues with like fire hydrant flows that the fire department reports to us that, you know, we're having troubles in San Anselmo at, on the street or, or something to that effect. And that gets integrated back into the $4.5 million that is collected through the, the individual payment per house. Great. Moving on to the, the bigger projects. Yeah, I'm, I'm, we'll head over to Tim Taylor. Yeah, so again, my name is Tim Taylor. I'm with Corolla Engineers. I appreciate the opportunity to come in front of you, talk about the conveyance and storage. So let's move on. Next piece of the puzzle. <clears throat> so just kind of a general overview of the conveyance. Um, reminder, the goal is to bring more supplemental water during the wintertime from Sonoma down into Marin. The various conveyance alternatives seek to move water from a point of connection near Sonoma's water, Sonoma Water's Katati tank site, through or around Petaluma into Marin Water Reservoirs. And, <clears throat> excuse me, additionally, the different conveyance alternatives have different alignments, challenges, costs, <clears throat> and yield. So that's kind of the important piece of the puzzle. As you know, there was Man, there were eight identified alternatives in the Swiss report. We actually added um, five more and to, to kind of round out what we thought was a good um, set of alternatives. And some of them are just additions to the, um, the existing ones. And some one of them is actually a whole new one that we've identified. And they range anywhere from seven miles to 26 miles of pipeline work. That's a lot of pipeline, <laughs> as well as pump station associated PG&E access for electrical. <clears throat> Excuse me. So let's start with what we're calling the Southern Transmission System. And this is the section between Katati tanks down to Castania pump station. And the, <clears throat> man, so I'm sorry. Uh, the what's what we're calling STS one basically parallels Highway one hundred one. <clears throat> the STS two um, basically goes along kind of the same alignment, but goes through the city of Petaluma. <clears throat> and then STS three is actually what Sonoma Water has already identified and done a sixty percent design of the alignment. And that's a pretty long alignment. Now, the advantages of these are reduces high velocity and flow constrictions in the Petaluma Aqueduct and incre increases system redundancy. However, the disadvantages are does not convey water to storage outside of the storage you have in your system. So that's a kind of a key point that I'd like to make sure I, I identify. You might explain what you mean by storage in the system. So there's two types of storage. There's what we call raw water storage, which are big open storage reservoirs. Thank you very much. Um, 
like Nicasio, Alpine, Kent, Sulahui. Storage inside the inside the distribution system are um, typically steel tanks, concrete tanks that house the water ready to be used immediately during your diurnal curves of, of water demand during the day. Um, <laughs> the other downside or disadvantage of, of these three alternatives are does not fix the constrictions downstream of Castagna pump station. And I'll talk about those here in a second. And they're actually a very challenging corridor because you have city of Petaluma. We all know how much fun it is to, uh, to work with Caltrans in a longitudinal encroachment. So keep those in mind. And I, I would just add, sorry. Yeah, no, just please. go ahead. I would just add one thing. So as we saw those project alternatives on the sort of the, 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 the summary sheet of the alternatives, we're going through each one individually because um, they're considered individual projects. So we're evaluating them individually. And as you'll see later, uh, they may get combined at some point later on into combinations of projects. Okay. Um, Tim, quick question, two quick questions. Yep. First one, STS-3, you said that Sonoma Water's done a 60% study for it so far. What was the reason for doing it? It was a capacity. For their uh, they, system internally. We were looking at the capacity of that pipeline that goes from Katadi through uh, Petaluma and uh, considering that you know future demand at the time, there wasn't much recycled water use in Petaluma. So they were projecting higher demands for potable water on their system. And they were approaching a velocity constraint that they have imposed on that Petaluma aqueduct. So this would have been a sort of a secondary supply line. Is there an opportunity to partner with them, cost share on this one? <clears throat> um, I, I think that would depend on the, the benefits. I mean, if Petaluma saw it as a benefit, I think yes. And that's one of the sort of strategic actions that we have is once we settle on a preferred project to sort of discuss uh, with our key partners if there are opportunities for partnership like that. Great. Keep in mind, though, that these kind of limits like they're talking about are arbitrary. The velocity we once, those are actually energy issues. The um, head loss goes with the square of the velocity. So when they set a, a number, they're really talking about controlling the amount of energy that they want to input to it. It isn't something going wrong with the pipe, like it's not going to scour the pipe or something like that. It's well below those kind of numbers. It's just a desire to keep the head loss down, the friction. Gotcha. And so for our demand coming out of the Sonoma system, we need a pipe that's bigger than 33 inches if we're going to be really maximizing what we're doing here moving forward. And that's the, the goal of this. I think you're jumping ahead okay. a little bit. Okay. But I'm going to gave away my whole okay. presentation. <laughs> Quite all right. <laughs> so now, then we looked at what was is called the Stafford transmission system. And that is taking water off of um, the aqueduct, the North Marin aqueduct, utilizing the North Marin pipeline that exists right now that takes water to Stafford Lake and kind of picking up there at Stafford Lake and moving water over to Nicasio and Sulahui. <clears throat> so Stafford 1 goes to Nicasio. Stafford 2 would go to um, Sulahui. <clears throat> Stafford 3 uh, would go to both. So, you know, if you're kind of passing the grocery store, you want to <laughs> pick up something along the way. So you want to take advantage of, of that as well in Stafford 3. But keep in mind, we're we're taking paid for potable drinking water and putting it in an open water reservoir, which then has to be retreated. Yes. It's not treated coming in because it gets a special exclusion from the state. But, you know, so you're talking about another $700 an acre foot to treat the water. So keep that in mind that that's this, it's true yeah. what Tim said, but it's kind of like taking your fresh clean laundry and putting it on the ground and then picking it back up in the car, you know? Yep. So the advantages of um, this alternative, these alternatives are conveys water to storage reservoirs. Obviously you have Nicasio and Sulahui. It utilizes existing infrastructure and it, the existing infrastructure has, has capacity in it in the wintertime. 
because it's not taken to the extreme limitation of its capacity like it is in the summer. Disadvantages are the water supply benefit limited by the existing North Marin water um, pipeline has about a maximum capacity of 7.3 MGD. And at certain times, North Marin uses that pipeline to fill some of their reservoirs. So it's actually the, the available capacity could be anywhere between 2.8 and 7.3, which you'll see here in a, a second. You know, just, just coming back to this point on treated water. So coming in. So my understanding is that the water that we currently receive from Sonoma, that is treated. It goes through the Ignacio, I think, treatment plant for a little bit of additional treatment before it enters our distribution system. Correct. But I didn't understand that if we were to bring in winter water from the Russian River, that that would also be treated water that comes to us. It would be. It would be, yeah. It'd be the same same water. I see. Same water that it, that goes to Ignacio, it's, it would be the same. Right, right. So even that additional winter water supply, if we were to access that, would go through the same treatment before it is sent south. Yes, sir. I see. Yeah, it's it, drinking water. It's drinking, and, 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 and there's... It wouldn't go through Ignacio. It wouldn't go through Ignacio. Yeah, for no. sure. but, but there isn't any option for importing raw water then from... The We'd Russian River. Adding another 26 miles or so of pipe. Okay. You know, you'd be going direct to the source and right. building your own collector on the Russian River, which would be a fantastically exciting project, but I think beyond our scope. And keep in mind that the, there's another problem with all this, not with what you're talking about, with what you're talking about. The peak flow at Guerneville in a storm is 30,000 acre feet a day. Mm. Our total water use in one day. The problem is, yeah, so what? How do you get it out of there? You know, you got 10 foot diameter pipes and 500, 5,000 horsepower pumps that sit and get unused for three years out of four. Then you decide you need them. And then what do you do? So it's tricky. Um, it, it, it is conceptually an interesting subject. The practicality of it, it's very difficult. So let's move on to the, the next set of alternatives, which are being called the Petaluma Aqueduct System. And Petal 1, 2, and 3 were straight from the Swisser report. We actually added what we're calling Peta 4, and I'll show you here in a second. But um, Peta 1 goes to Nicasio, and that basically goes from the same turnout location as North Marin Waters Pipeline but not using North Marin's pipeline. So you're basically paralleling their pipeline because you can put in, at that point, you can put in a bigger pipe, you have more capacity. <clears throat> and PETA 2 goes out to Sulahui Reservoir. Obviously, PETA 3 is a combination of going to both reservoirs to maximize your storage um, for the system. Now, <clears throat> PETA 4, which unfortunately is a yellow line on this map that is hard to see, but one of the things as I get into the hydraulics of this, we looked at where could we optimize the best capacity location and take as much water off without affecting the overall system. And that is up by Santa Ant or San Antonio Road up in um, north of um, the North Marin Aqueduct Connection. And we're calling that turnout two. And I'll show you a reason why in a second. But the advantages of these alternatives are convey water to storage reservoirs, obviously, utilize existing infrastructure, a higher water supply benefit compared to the Stafford alternatives because of the fact that you're putting in a, a parallel pipeline, you're not limited by the North Marin pipeline. And then the disadvantages, upstream improvements also require, depending on desired water supply. So You'll see here in a second what I mean by that. But maybe before, if we go back yeah. just one, Tim, um, just to highlight. Let, should we go back? Go. I'll let you do it, Paul. <laughs> yeah. So as we, we, we look at all these great colored lines on here, I just want to highlight one aspect of these, and that is you can begin to see how these might be phased projects, 
right? If you harken back to the Stafford option where we're connecting to the end of the North Marin pipeline that's coming off of the, their aqueduct right next to Stafford Lake, that's a fairly relatively short section of pipe between Stafford and Nicasio or Stafford and Sulahuli. And then you could add this section of pipe connecting back to the main aqueduct that would boost your capacity. And, and Tim will get into these capacity considerations later. I just wanted to highlight that not all of the projects, and we'll see an example of one in the next set of slides, are just sort of one shot, big, huge project that you have to do tomorrow. You know, So there are opportunities for us, and we'll talk more about phasing as we go on. Right. In fact, isn't that exactly what happened in 76, that we weren't connected to North Marin's water supply, and that pipe got extended down here? That was actually what was done in 76 during the drought or after the drought, 78 or something like that. So if you think of that as the phase, the first phase was getting the water from the Rainies to North Marin. Yeah. Yeah. North Marin. And then it came to us. Yeah. So let's talk about the last set of alternatives and that's being called the Katati transmission system. And as Paul alluded to, it's like a one shot deal. It's the whole, <laughs> the whole kit and caboodle. So Katati one is going from the Katati tanks through the back roads of Sonoma County, down all the way to Nicasio. The uh, Katati 2 is the same thing, but going over to Sulahui. <clears throat> and then Katati 3 is basically a combination of those two. If you're gonna if you're gonna go to one, you might as well go to both, maximize the storage capacity. Um, How many miles? Uh, about 27 miles, so. You could do the math in your head on <laughs> costs. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the advantage is obviously it conveys water to storage reservoirs. The water supply benefit not limited by existing infrastructure. It provides system redundancy. Now you have a completely separate system that you operate in the wintertime. And if anything were to happen to the existing system, you have another system online. Other than the treatment plants. Correct. It still goes through the treatment plants we already have. So there's that's. Yeah. <clears throat> so the disadvantages obviously are does not utilize any existing MMWD infrastructure and additional pipeline and pump station infrastructure is going to be required. And PG. Yeah, that's that's the big one. <laughs> um, so the, the high level hydraulic model of these alternatives We've, we've already completed. And so now I want to kind of roll into that kind of discussion and what it means to each alternative. <clears throat> so the model considers the existing sy transmission system, all of the turnouts, um, the Petaluma, North Marin, Frosty Lane, and Ignacio um, booster pump station, as well as the wintertime demands. And that's important because what we're trying to do is utilize whatever capacity that's left in the system, maximize it, and then figure out where can we stress the system. <clears throat> so when you're looking at the Southern Transmission System, alternatives STS-1 through 3, if you look at the system demand of 17.5 MGD overall in the wintertime, it really provides no additional capacity. However, it does provide reliability between Katati tanks and Castagna pump station. <clears throat> the Stafford transmission system, staff one through three, again, system demand of 17.5. The additional capacity ranges from 2.8 to 7.3. And it, it goes back to the conversation I had when I first described the um, system. Sometimes North Marin uses that pipeline to fill their um, facilities. So there would have to be a coordination effort. So what we did is we looked at What's the minimum if they max out at the four and a half MGD in in their requirements to um, this you know zero? <clears throat> so now we get into PETA transmission system, and this is kind of a unique discussion because we looked at two different connection points. We call them turnouts. You know, a simpler version would be connection points. The PETA one through three 
is down by the existing North Marin connection. And that's really important to understand because as you come down the existing system, your pipeline diameters start to drop. Your capacity starts to drop as well because you have limiting factors of velocity, like uh, Director Russell said, pressure class, you know, existing condition, that kind of stuff. However, at turnout two, we looked at that turnout because there's a stretch <clears throat> of pipe that's 42 inches in diameter. And that gives us kind of the maximum capacity coming out of Castagna Pump Station. And it also gives us the opportunity to tweak Castagna Pump Station um, in different scenarios and actually phasing um, when you're looking at an overall project to be able to get you as much water as you can. So let's put it in, in perspective. Um, I had a serious argument with North Marin about that 42 inch. I tried to get them to 60. This was a pipeline that was 90% paid by Caltrans. All we had, this was because they were widening the freeway and it was over top of our line. All we had to do was pay the upgrade, which just materials. Everything else picked up by Caltrans. And I, I don't know exactly what Chris Gabriel, what his problem was. I never explained it to me. You know, I tried to show Chris, it's just make it as big as possible. What do you got to lose? But he had some resistance that I never detected. Perhaps Sequa, something going on that was never made clear to me. But I, I thought that was kind of silly that we set on that. But I got him bigger than he was. The, his pipeline diameter was set to get gravity flow from Castagna to here to not need the pump station. That's where his pipeline criterion, as far as I recall. And like I said, that's all fine. But then the bigger, the less head loss. So it, it's just better, especially when somebody else is paying 90% of the bill. Yeah. yeah. Good point. <clears throat> so let's take a look at the PETA 1, 2, and 3 alternatives. Um, so when you're looking at keeping the existing system as is, the limiting capacity segment is on the North Marin Aqueduct, that 30-inch pipeline. And so realistically, <clears throat> again, remember, it's it's paralleling the North Marin pipeline, so we can make it as big as we want, right? That connection pipeline. So we can maximize that piece of the system, and we can get about 10.4 MGD of excess capacity to basically go fill Nicasio and Sulahui. <clears throat> However, if we kind of stress the system, <laughs> um, we can do things to get an additional 4 MGD of excess capacity. However, I need to point out that means we're going to be doing um, some capacity increases at Castagna. We are exceeding typical velocity standards in pipeline, in transmission systems, above seven feet per second. And so up on the 33-inch, right out of Katati tanks, it's about 8.3. Not bad. I mean, you're not going to be operating this 24-7, you know, 365 days a year. So it's it's doable. Um, and then as you work your way down, you'll see 8.3, 8.4. Not bad. You get down to that 30 inch and now you're stressing it at 9.3. <clears throat> I know that um, North Marin, <laughs> I see you're going to turn on your mic. <laughs> um, you know, North Marin has set that uh, criteria at eight feet per second max. So there'd have to be some discussion, negotiation with North Marin to be able to go to that 9.3. So did you want to say something, Director Russell? Oh, only that when I was at Montgomery, we used 10 feet per second as that max. And like I say, it's an energy issue, not nothing to do with the pipeline itself. It's just how much energy you want to put into pushing the water. Yeah. The, the other challenge is we don't know the condition of the pipe. We don't know, um, you know, how well the interior um, coating is. You start exceeding nine feet per second, you could start peeling the coating off. I've seen it happen. It happened on the EBDA outfall because their velocities were high. Coating started to peel off. All the coating ended up at the bottom of the hill. So it, there are concerns. There's nothing we couldn't work out from an engineering standpoint. It's just all money, right? 
Plus, they were just inside the pipeline, right, with the landslide. Yes. You know, so they, they did video of the condition. I don't know. I, what I understood was no big deal. Uh, yeah, I have not seen the video, so I can't. Um, well, the, the pipe was apparently that. squished, mm -hmm. and it didn't knock the coating off, as I understand it from a very brief from yeah. um, information from Tony. Okay, moving on. <clears throat> so Petaphor is an interesting alternative. Um, again, it's at that turnout two, right off the 42 inch. Um, again, system demand of 17.5. If, if we look at the existing system, the only capacity deficiency is Castani pump station because we're going higher up right downstream of Castania and we can get about 12 and a half MGD out of the system without doing any existing improvements. However, if we want to look at doing some existing improvements, how do we maximize up to 30 MGD? And really what that alternative looks like is basically building from the connection point at turnout two, going to Nicasio and Sulahui, and maximizing the system, doing some improvements at Castania pump station. However, this alternative requires one of the STSs to be able to get that 30 MGD through Castania pump station. Wouldn't that also supply redundancy it on would. the part that slid, yeah. right? Uh, yeah. I'm, I it's forget. right upstream. Yeah, exactly of the, where the slide is. It's but... upstream of the part that slid. So it yeah. would add, yeah. so Peta 4 does have, it goes San Antonio Road and does, you're right, give that redundancy. Yeah, which I think would push North Marin. North Marin, I think, would be very interested in that alternative yes. because I, I think they realize well, pg and &E is probably interested too but that's a different issue um they realize the vulnerability because i don't think it ever was even conceived of that there could be a landslide there or to take out the pipe so then the katati transmission system obviously standalone system we could design it whatever whatever you can get out of sonoma water right but what we did is we we basically set it at 30 mgd for discussion purposes to to kind of be able to correlate it to the peta 4 alternative now one of the things that you got to think about is all of those capacities of you know 7.3 mgd 10.1 12.5 25.6 and 30 if you have to start thinking about how much water you can take in a, on a monthly basis and how long, because that really dictates how I design these pipelines and, and size the pump stations. Because, you know, if, if you, if you set a criteria of, let's say, you know, 5,000 acre feet, that's going to say, well, I can do 12 and a half MGD for four months, so I can do 30 MGD for one month, you know? And, and so we got to start having that conversation and, and that conversation is going to continue after tonight. So I just want to make sure it's, we're all talking the same talk. So this is just a summary of all the alternatives. I've, we've put the length of pipe in miles just so you kind of have it in your head. It's fun to look at a graphic map, but you know, once you start thinking, oh, that's 25 miles, it's a lot of pipe in the ground, paving, trenching. And it goes without saying, right, Tim, that the longer the pipe, the more money yeah. you're paying for the project. But and some of these are going cross country. So this is not going down the side of the freeway. <clears throat> you know, this is this is tough trekking. Yep. So what we tried to do is stick to county roads where we absolutely could. You're right, Director Russell. There are some sections that have to go cross, really cross country. Um, but you know, my wife and I go out to Bodega Bay a lot, and you drive those roads out, and they were just paved. And so, think about what Sonoma County is going to request, or what City of Petaluma is going to request if you're going down through their city streets. So, and then the last column is just the what we're calling the water supply benefit to to think about, you know, MGD and then to start the conversation about 
how many acre feet per year that you guys are really going to require. So again, this is the proposed evaluation criteria that, that Paul mentioned early on in the presentation. These are, are very similar. We're trying to keep them kind of the, the criteria similar to the different projects. So your storage project and our, you know, this conveyance project um, so that everybody's talking the same thing. And I, I believe uh, President Kush, you were asking about um, schedule. <laughs> so summary and next steps for, for this project, the conveyance project, we're targeting um, the following schedule and next step, bring in um, the discussion on criteria and evaluation of alternatives and identification of the top three alternatives at the April 2nd board meeting, um, May 17th ops meeting review analysis for top three, and then June 18th, identify the preferred project. Remember, what we're trying to do is a two-phased approach. Take the 13 alternatives, call them down to three, and then do a deep dive into those three and outcome a preferred alternative. And with that, I'll open it. If anybody has any questions for me or? Where do we start? Yeah, sure. <laughs> you know, I, I'll, I'll start. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I know we're getting on. I, listen, I, I want to appreciate the fact that we didn't just look at our first set of ideas. That through this process, you've you've uncovered some really interesting new alternatives, uh, and and it seems like we're expanding, you know, the options. But really, what we're doing is we're we're enabling ourselves to hone in really tight, pretty quickly here, uh, and and have a have a long term impact. My guess is it won't be just identify the preferred project. This this will be a phased approach that will happen over time that we increasingly find resilience for our for our customers. So, yeah, so yeah. If, you, if you look at the Petaphor yeah. alternative and say you wanted to go, you know, ultimately wanted to say, we want to get to 30 MGD. Yep. Um, that's a phased project, right? So you're going to build from turnout to maybe to Nicasio, maximize the storage there, and then do the offshoot Phase two might be um, offshoot to Sulahui. Phase three would be the upgrade at Castagna Pump Station. Phase four would be the STS, you know, and that could be a 30 year, 40 year project. So, anyone else? Matt? I'd just like to um, say thank you for this uh, presentation because the information you provided is, is very helpful and starting to bring a lot of clarity to this project. Um, and I just I can't repeat enough how important it is for the resiliency and the redundancy as part of this, especially what we experienced this last winter and seeing vulnerabilities exposed through ways we weren't expecting. So having those um, or that characteristic or, or criteria built in is very important. So thank you. Larry, anything else? Uh, it was very interesting. I I really like that right side graphic you have on those blue yeah. line. That's a very helpful, yeah. um, a, a little bit simplistic, but um, it's helpful, especially for less water people uh to see what's going on and um it it's something you didn't mention it seems to me that this would extend to sonoma water as well there's probably motor electric motor efficiencies that would make sense to even if it's just a few percent motors are relatively large and there's probably a value in just changing out the motors and or increasing the size, changing the pump in the motor to achieve, a, you know, one, two, three percent improvement in efficiency that kind of gets thrown into this um, that goes along with it. The other question I have is, do you have any idea why they crossed 101, where they crossed 101? I have no idea. Because that <laughs> seems to me to be a very tricky part of this whole project. I think getting Caltrans's buy-in on some kind of a bore under the freeway is are you talking about the sts3 yeah okay <clears throat> um yeah i don't know why you know and, and plus you saw they went way out that yeah that pipeline is actually five miles longer than sts1 or two it's yeah. like four or five miles longer and it could have been just um some environmental stuff that they were trying to stay away from you, you know typically I mean, I do a lot of Caltrans crossings yeah. and they're all either jack and bores or horizontal directional drills. So it, it's this diameter pipe. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I've done 90 inch across Caltrans. So. Yeah. It's, um, it's just curious to me because I, I can see why they were east of the freeway because it's in the mud flats more or less. But when they, I don't quite, and they got to cross sooner or later because they got to get over to North Marin. But it's just odd looking to me. There's no, They're not following contours or anything like that. And there would be no need to follow contour with a pressure pipe. It's just a weird, weird layout. Um, maybe the freeway moved. I don't know. Maybe that were, you know, they were thinking something different long-term plans or something like that. I don't know. Yeah. I haven't, I haven't done a deep dive into, you know, those plans. I've just kind of looked at them periphery. Yeah. And I don't think it matters. I think yeah. you're, you're on it's a good, an interesting question. Good track, Tim. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Just my thanks as well for all of the effort. I think this is, um, as we know, a, a historical effort that has been a long time in sort of the thinking we're finally entering the the planning and implementation stages. I'm really, really curious to see the selection there, the criteria you're going to be using, the scoring criteria to start to narrow things down. I imagine there's going to be a lot of complexity in that. And it makes me think of that sort of that engineering uh, cliche uh, measure twice cut once that given the level of complexity here, I'm, I think, you know, the amount of attention we pay to those details that narrow us down to the final decisions is going to be critical. I, you know, in, in, in some of the places where I work, there's a, there's a tendency to build a lot of infrastructure that leads to what is often referred to as um, stranded assets or, or you know, sure. and, and, and I think having that in mind as well, that comes back to your, you know, your note that we have to understand what our demand requirements are that, you know, we ultimately want to achieve through this effort. I think, as you said, Jed, it's probably going to be a, a phased approach. So we start with a specific target, but ideally give ourselves the flexibility to continue to build upon that. But um, exciting stuff. Thank you. I think that actually comes from Taylor's, the measure twice, cut once. Oh, not from okay. engineers. Not but, from engineers. Uh, okay. <laughs> That's funny. So this is a little bit like the Ginsu knives. Um, there's more as, as, <laughs> as, as much as you already heard. Uh, we, we just want to give you a, a, a much briefer presentation of where we are with the local storage element. And I guess one one point that you just brought up, uh, President Kush, you know, is thinking about, um, you know, the, the capacity and making choices. I think we want to bear in mind storage plays a part here and the storage and conveyance may well um, have some synergistic benefits if if, you know, there might be a right size project of both. We need to bear that in mind. So it's worth it's worth just considering that, even though we'll get into a storage in a lot more detail at a future meeting. I want to give you a, a glimpse of where we are. So this is the starting point, which is the, the Swiss report identified 10 alternatives. So upgrades to uh, really it's one of three dams, but different ways to enhance storage at Nicasio or building one of two new dams, Halleck or Devil's Gulch, or doing spillway reconfiguration at one or all of those, those four listed reservoirs. So just as the, the um, conveyance team under Tim's leadership was looking at, okay, that's our starting point. Um, we'd like to narrow it, but maybe actually we need to start by, you know, identifying interesting sub alternatives and spinoffs. The same sort of thing is going on. You know, let's make sure that we, we define the concepts, first of all, as laid out. And then uh, the, the team has been doing things like visiting the sites, identifying constraints based on visiting the sites, as well as reviewing a lot of detailed information. And they've started to develop new information. And with that, you know, I, I think what we're seeing is the same sort of creative thinking as you, you just got a, a taste of on conveyance is happening on storage as well. So the, re the review of existing records, um, just some of the some of the the findings that they're they're coming across as Nicasio, um, among all of them that they've looked at for the the option of adding spillway gates, it it looks like it might have it might have been thought at the time to that maybe we would want to raise the spillway without having to raise the dam. I mean, because the end the, the idea would be is there is there essentially excess freeboard sitting there so that it would allow us to put in. A, a gated spillway that might actually impound quite a bit of water and be able to carry it over seasonally and still not have to raise the dam. So that's an interesting option. Uh, for all of the sites, one of the things they're looking at is, well, they understand how the original dam was built. 
Um, namely, where did the material come from? Um, maybe there's more because the, you know, for all of the, an earthen dam, if you're going to work on it, usually the economics, as well as the, a lot of the important impacts from a CEQA point of view, they're governed by where's the material coming from and going to and, and so on. You want it to be sourced from as close as possible. So they're, they're getting some insights into that. And then something that I, I think we didn't necessarily expect as they looked at Alpine, that they understand that it, it's been raised twice already in its history, but it looks like it was thought through potentially as, as being raised in a way that would allow it to be raised yet again. So I think that's emerging as, as an important alternative to look at, although it wasn't in the original list. And there's one more, um, this, call this one a sub alternative. And this one has to do with Nicasio. So if you look at Nicasio today, you, you, um, you, you probably have driven along that road. I think it's called Point Reyes Petaluma Road. And you, um, at high water, you, have, you definitely see water on either side of the road fairly nearby. And I'll zoom in on this view. But they were, they were thinking about, well, how could we make this, this thing work and, and minimize um, concerns, for example, the, the nearby town of Nicasio, minimize impacts on that. And trying to, they were thinking about ways to make that, that happen because there, there are intrinsic challenges. And I think they, they they came on a new idea based on that. So this is a zoomed in view of what you saw where you're going along the road, you see water on either side and you, you briefly are driving on an island and that's existing, that's today's situation. So if, if you just simply um, raised Nicasio Dam, that problem would get worse, you'd actually inundate the road. So factored into this, at least at first glance, this alternative involves raising that road potentially a significant cost as well as impact to, to do that. Not a fatal flaw, but it's like, the, um, is there a way to make, make that unnecessary? So you go from the existing and the, the new idea you might say is what if instead of, instead of just raising the, the existing dam, put in, put in another dam. So you're, you're isolating that, that existing impoundment of water, but you can, you can impound more. In fact, you can, uh, the geometry is pretty favorable, so you can get 20,000 acre feet with the footprint you see here. So fairly sizable with a with a relatively small dam. We're talking about 100 feet tall or so. So of, of course, in this in this version of it, you're actually leaving the road untouched. So it's this is something that's being developed, very preliminary, and I, I don't want to steal all their thunder, but I wanted to give you a, um, the, the, you know, just the sense of the work that is 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 underway right now that they've been working very hard on making sure they really run all these interesting ideas to ground. Quick question: Would that get its water from the current reservoir then, that area? Mm -hmm. Well, that's that's a good question. There's a couple options. Uh, th there isn't enough watershed for it to just spill naturally. So one way or the other, uh, we. I mean, one idea would be pump water from Nicasio into what would be maybe termed upper Nicasio. It'd be a low lift pump station and relatively low pumping rates because it's an emergency supply. So you wouldn't be cycling its volume every year. You'd, you'd basically fill it with 20,000 acre feet. And then after that only make up for evaporation losses in between droughts. Um, that's one idea. There also could be a way um, to to fill it by way of Sulahuli. And, and it, you know that we're looking at ways to improve that conveyance. Right. So there's at least a couple of ways that this thing could be kept full. More to follow. Yeah, thank you. It, it's kind of like Sulahuli already. This upper, I like this. It's cute. Um, I think another thing that would help it is if we could get the materials from dredging. That's something that's really fascinating to the public the idea of deepening the reservoirs. Uh, I, it's probably too fine to use for that purpose, I think, well, but it might not be. I don't know. I think the records, the team have indicated that for Nicasio, most of the material was sourced from within the reservoir. Right, but that doesn't mean the runoff carried that material into the reservoir. It, it could be much, much finer materials that suspended and, and settled in the reservoir. But it's worth looking at, and and I think it's it's got an interesting uh, advantage. I don't know how much concern the town would have about having another dam, you know, sort of like Shasta problem with the spillway. Um, something to think about. But it's 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 and and, and Penn had mentioned too. It's a single landowner or something to deal with. So there's a, a solution. Um, 
now just putting things in perspective that 20,000 acre feet of water is at least $20 million worth of water that you put in there and then it evaporates. So you, you're right. You can do it, but it's not cheap to, to shove that 20,000 um, acre feet in there. Yeah. And I, I think we'd have to figure out what is, what are the evaporative and infiltration losses? Are there other, are there other benefits from improving conveyance from Sula Hule? Um, uh, Director Russell, yeah, it's interesting because the cost of the water would be if we're buying it from Sonoma, right? But sure. one of the ideas that was mentioned is um, you bring it from Nicasio. So, sure. right, this time we're spilling in Nicasio, so it'd be perfect. In this theory, you'd be filling that with essentially free water. But the spill may not, well, I got to pump it, but. Right, the, and just... there's maybe a 5% roughly i think is a good number for the board to think evaporative losses yeah so you fill it up five percent and you look at our cycle it may work i mean you know we have numbers to do but i mean it may work in terms of using the spill or preventing the spill right from nicasio does that make sense yeah it does uh there's a question about its shape you know as i recall these are relatively flat areas relatively as opposed to some place like alpine so the 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 bang the, the bang for the buck isn't isn't so good on the height of the dam it's okay but it's not it's not a steep yeah you know, like um, lake mead or one of those places so you've got a lot of surface area for a relatively small amount of water so the evaporation loss you got to be careful there because you, you the spill might not even equal the evaporation loss so. And I'm sure we're only scratching the surface of what we'll hear about from the, the dam team when they come in. And th they think a lot about things like gradation of available materials. And um, if you can dredge among, besides grain size distribution, it's like, well, it, you, obviously then you have to dry it. So you think about the construction sequence to get that done. Or you borrow from the island. That's the consideration. But our argument was, the one Paul made was that it was impractical to truck this material out because of the cost and the volume, even though it's relatively small from a storage standpoint, it's relatively big from a, a 10 cubic yard dump truck size. You're right. So that's a sense of where we are with storage. So uh, coming attractions on storage, you, you see that what's happening now, the, these sub alternatives have been identified. They're being a further refined. So I think when you see it again, there might be a little more information and a lot more expertise to be able to entertain some detailed questions. Uh, the project schedule uh, for the storage element certainly needed to be adjusted to incorporate these new concepts that really need to be, I think, fleshed out to give us a, a fair comparison. And we do have an update planned for you next month that'll feature storage. And with that, I think Paul has an overall wrap up here. Yeah, so as we as we heard earlier on on conveyance, there was a detailed schedule. We'll be back to you April second. Um, if we can find a meeting earlier than that, we will um, uh, come to you with that discussion on criteria and evaluation and screening. On um, the storage alternatives, we're targeting completion of that shortlist by August. So you, you'll have the shortlist analysis and sort of a identification or an idea of what the preferred alternative will be in August timeframe. Um, and so we've got a fair amount of work, as you can see from where we are today, to get to the short list and then to that to that final uh, preferred in August. Um, we're coming to the board March 19th with sort of a detailed update on the, the storage. So tonight is just very much a teaser and to give you an idea of the things the team has been up to since we last met. I think that concludes our slides. Any other board comments? Thank you for the efforts on this part too. I know running these projects in parallel is quite a big effort. And so I appreciate you guys coming on and helping out and making this happen. And and definitely to mirror what Jeb was saying, let's not take our foot off the gas on this one because we have to keep moving. But I think it's also important to remain somewhat or keep, uh, maintain somewhat of a perspective. You know, we look at history, the 78, 77 drought, 76, 77 drought. The answer to that drought was really Sewell Hooley in the, in the raising of Kent Dam, which didn't happen for six, seven years after the drought. So um, 
I'm I'm comfortable with where we're going right now in terms of timing. I really look forward to the next meetings where we can start making some decisions and actually be able to present some of the facts moving forward. So thank you very much again. Looking forward to the next presentation. Good. Yeah, I, I commend the team. You know, we approved a roadmap less than a year ago and we're beginning to implement it. So we've listened to the public, we're doing the work. And we're getting off the ground. So I really appreciate your thoughtful approach. You're bringing some new concepts to the table. And I look forward to uh, getting to action. Larry, anything else? Yeah, I think one thing to be added to this presentation is that uh, Ben indicated that 9517 uh, order is actually applicable May to November. So it has potential that we're, our restrictions are in the summer, not in the winter. So we may be in a situation here where there's a, a thin line you can kind of skate us through without it needing to get 9517 reopened. Um, as I've said many times, the concern I have about 9517 is that you, you think you're asking for one thing, but they come up with a whole new set of criteria that you never thought of remembering that initially they asked for 50% of the water. They negotiated down to 25. You reopen that. It's kind of like the IRS in an audit. You know, you want to open a new place. They go, okay, but understand there could be downside of that. Yeah. I mean, risk. It's, it's a great point. These projects storage, particularly maybe is 60% engineering. We, we've got other things that we need to take care of as well. In addition to the engineering updates that we're bringing you today and, We'll bring those other updates and discussions to the board as we make progress on them. And it's and, it and, like and Larry, you're, you're specifically referring to the water rights that are going to be not a water rights. Uh, no, I'm re referring to the lawsuit when the state board sued the district over the take of water on Loganese Creek. Right, but they, but but in as part of this storage discussion, we will be looking at the water right aspects. To yes, this. and the order does have. Um, limitations on the amount we can have in storage. So it plays directly potentially into this. And Director Russell was talking about, you know, a potential path. But um, yeah, I think probably the 60-40 is a good number. Maybe it's 50-50 with the, these kind of projects, a lot of non-engineering work and the, the regulatory, the CEQA, um, uh, you're taking um, land, on the off mountain reservoir. So a tremendous amount of, uh, buying, buying ahead. the land, not taking it. Yes. And the other thing you mentioned, Ben, which, Inundating, I, which so. was really, yes, but that could be used seasonally too. Right. Um, the other thing you mentioned, which is absolutely true is we have a lot more data on the fish than we did when the initial efforts were made, um, including the state board's action in 95. There was a lot of supposition about what could be well we have filled some of those gaps so it doesn't mean it's it's a wide open door but at least it's just open for discussion that's that's a, that's a that's positive larry thanks for that uh any public comments Aaron? yes uh we have a couple mr larry minicus please and then marilyn price yeah, I want to thank you for the presentation it it was very complete tonight and uh the idea of Upper Nicasio, it's the first time we've seen this, and it's it's very interesting, to say the least. Uh, obviously, you'd have to empty the reservoir, and there may be a risk there if we hit a drought at the same time that this uh, work is going on. And I think what would be interesting to understand is if a well-designed conveyance system, because we, we've been talking about going from what is roughly a two-year supply to trying to get up to a four or even higher year supply of water. Would a well-designed conveyance system perhaps negate the need to increase capacity by X amount, 10,000 10, or 20,000 acre feet? Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Price, please. 
Yeah, well, I must say I am really impressed with all that you do and the challenge that you are facing and uh, all your hard work. It's just blows my mind. It's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I kind of feel like a broken record, but I always want to kind of speak up for this conservation. I noticed at the beginning of your slide of this presentation, you had, I think, five things. Three of them had the red... Um, square a box around them and conservation was down at the bottom you know i do hope and i'm so pleased to see that you're in this phase of of your your work uh where you're you're looking at uh what to do um and we're in a little bit in terms of conservation we're in a little bit of a difficult time with getting public support now because we're not in a drought you know, people are kind of like, well, not as concerned. But um, I know that from stuff that I read every day, because um, I keep track of a lot of this stuff, there's a lot that communities are doing around the country. And I hope you, as you're having different people present to you, you look long and hard at some of these very novel uh, conservation things. In, you know, in Arizona, down there in Los Angeles and, and elsewhere, and and prioritize this conservation. Um, you, you talked about uh, stranded ass assets. As we do conservation, we won't have those stranded assets. You know, we are altering. Um, uh, it, it'll be something that we have to do forever and it won't get stranded. And, and then we're also altering uh, the way the public uh, is changing their behavior and approaching this. So that's that's my spiel for tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Price. There are no further speakers. Great. Thanks, Paul, Xavier, Tim. Really appreciate the updates. One more thing. As Ms. Price just said, and Benjamin Franklin said, waste not, want not. And, you know, obviously everything you can do in conservation is beneficial across the board and, and we're well aware of that but we'll see you guys tomorrow morning on that very topic i think uh terry just uh, the last item is future board and committee meetings yes i'm just going to highlight a couple uh the first one is um, as paul said tomorrow morning at 9 30 is our communications and water efficiency committee meeting and then we'll have a big watershed committee meeting uh, this Thursday, February 29th at 6 p.m. City Hall of San Rafael. Uh, another one to highlight again is March 14th is the board retreat. And that will begin at 10 a.m. at the Fairfax Women's Club. And then also another highlight is this coming uh, Friday is the North Bay Watershed Association meeting at 9.30 um, I do want to bring to your attention an update on the ops uh, committee meeting for April, just letting you know that two of uh, the chair and the vice chair can make August 12th, but the rest could do August 26th. So if you like, oh, I'm sorry, April. So, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, if you want me to reschedule or try to find another date for April 5th, uh, let me know, or if there's no other way. Um, let me know what the final, uh, what your, you know, what you would like to do, and then I'll get back to you probably by the end of this week. Good. Um, yeah, let, April fifth works for me. Let me. Maybe we can all just check quickly. Well, that'd be great. Well, you, you got to watch out too. Is it work for the district? Because there's a reason that the doc hits where it hits, in terms of need. We did check and propose that as an alternative meeting time. If right, works. I mean, since make it work, okay. Works for me. April fifth, okay. April fifth. April fifth. April fifth. Okay. No, don't hold it up for me. Okay. All right. Okay. So let's, um, if you like, we'll go ahead and schedule it for April fifth. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen, and that's all for this evening that I have. Thank you, everyone. With that, we'll adjourn the uh, Marin Water Board meeting of February 27, 2024.